Good morning, everybody. I'm Christine Murray, Editor-in-Chief of The Developer and Director of the Festival of Place. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Festival of Place Bite Size, which is a free taster of the Festival of Place event. This morning, we're going to be hearing from Alexandra Notai, Placemaking and Investment Director at PFP Capital, on how the fragmented and siloed property industry is making it difficult to invest in net zero and failing on other counts, too, like gender equality and accessibility. Uh, we're going to be joined in a conversation with uh, Martha Thorne, D of IE uh, School of Architecture and Design. Um, and we're going to have a Q&A going by the end of the session. So I really hope you guys are, um, are paying attention and ready with some questions for us because we'd love to get that discussion going for you. If this is your first time at on AirMeet and you haven't been to one of our events, before, the most important thing is to find the emoji button, which is here. It's got a happy face on it. Uh, and you can send some applause and uh, thumbs up. I think there are hearts. There are, oh yeah, sunglass people. Thank you very much. That's great. You know, that really helps us to see that you're out there and it really kind of buoys our spirits and keeps us going. Um, so so do send emojis. We're kind of addicted to them. Um, this, uh, this morning session is run in association with IE School of Architecture and design its master's program uh, for professionals. Uh, the part-time global master in real estate development attracts the next generation of investors, developers, architects, and urban planners from around the world. Um, and they are also seeking applications for uh, their women uh, scholarships. So I'm going to let Martha talk a little bit about that to you uh, this morning. Um, don't forget to get your tickets to the Festival of Place, uh, the real session. We're running a, a special for all of you attendees today. So if you can find the chat, which is over here, um, you can see we have a promotional code FLASH30 running today. You can get 30% off your ticket for being here today in this session. But it gives me great um, pleasure to introduce Martha Thorne, a Dean of IE School uh, of Architecture and Design. Good morning, Martha. Nice to see you, nice to be with you. Great to have you here too. I'm going to um, let you tell us a little bit. I'm really, I'm particularly excited about the women's scholarship. So I do want everybody here to know about that and, and the kind of candidates that you're speaking. And it might be useful for them to know a little bit about uh, IE School as well. Great. Well, Christine, you, you know something about us. Um, and I think uh, Festival of Place also reflects our holistic point of view when it comes to understanding the built environment and how the built natural and digital environments are connected. Um, we are a school of architecture and design, but we go beyond the traditional boundaries. And so real estate is a very important part of our, our mission. And to look at real estate as city making, it's uh, of course it's investing, it's finance, it's management, but it's also city making. And we know that city makers are better when there's diversity. Diversity is a goal at IE, uh, School of Architecture and Design and our whole university. We teach in English, we have an international audience of students, faculty and staff and people who are from our community who also participate with us. But there is one problem. In the real estate industry, we still don't see enough diversity. Of course, people from around the world participate, but traditionally it's a field that's more dominated by men than women. There are several reasons for this I won't go into now, but I will just say that at IE, we think that diversity, not only of gender, nationality, but outlooks, different professions, how we can all contribute to this more holistic, fair, and forward-looking panorama is what we try to do. And in order to do that, we have established several scholarships to identify talented women who want to study. Not everyone wants to take a break from their career. That's one option. But if people would like to study and work at the same time, we do have a blended program, which is mainly online with um, short residential periods and especially women who are working or have other ab obligations of personal life uh, are, encouraged, uh, are encouraged to apply for a women's scholarship because we do want to seek that gender balance and also those many different points of view. So I believe in the chat there, there is um, a, a web address. 
Uh, and if not, we'll be sure to put the website there. And again, Christine, thank you for having IE participate. We share many synergies with you and certainly with Alexandra. So it's great to be here talking about real estate from many perspectives um, and many points of view because it's so important uh, for all of us because we live, we live in cities, we live in real estate and the built environment uh, is more and more complex and more and more interesting for discussions like this. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, we talked about, uh, we've talked about this many times. I know um, we've talked about actually the the changing shape of investment in real estate, which Alex is going to talk to us today. We've talked about uh, between the two of us about gender equity, which I know Alex is going to, you know, touch on as I'm really looking forward to the discussion after the chat. Um, well, I think it's time for me to introduce Alex, or would you like to go ahead and do it? Why don't you introduce Alex in, um, Martha? If you're comfortable. It, it's, a, it's a pleasure to introduce Alex Note, of course, is internationally recognized. She's an expert on built to rent, placemaking, and sustainable urban development. She has had uh, more than 16 years strategic advisory experience and not only as an advisor, but in terms of investment in the public sector, private sector, and third sector organizations from around the world in four different continents. She's a published author and perhaps some of our listeners today will have seen uh, her editing or her articles in over 30 books and reports on real estate. And I'll just call out the ones, the ULI, UK Best Practice Guide on Build to Rent. She, uh, she wrote in two issues in 2014 and 16, and we all know how important Build to Rent is. It's a very special sector of real estate. She was also vice chair of the ULA uh, Urban Land Institute, UK Residential Council. Um, she's in different organizations as members. And one thing particularly interesting to me is she's a board member uh, for the Southwest Board member of Land Aid. And this a land trust is very important as they move into cities. Um, she, and then Alexandra, in my few conversations with her, I've always seen her great passion about enabling tangible social impact through innovation and collaboration. And she's a great mentor to the next generation. Christine, thanks for presenting, uh, introducing me to Alexandra. Alexandra, I'll turn it over to you because I know everyone wants to hear from you this morning. Martha, thank you so much. And as a Brit, it's somewhat mortifying to have anybody read anything good about you, back to you, what you've done. And I should say, I cannot claim credit for having written the, the ULI Build to Rent guys. I was merely the editor. I did a lot of cat herding and a lot of kind of experts drawing in and lots of kind of late night editing, which I'm sure you'll understand. But it's it's been a real privilege to be involved with that sector as it grows um, across the UK and Europe and Australia as well. Um, Christine, thank you as well for having me. It's super exciting. I know our prep calls I kind of, you know, we got into so much breadth that I know you kept expanding the topics we were covering. So to be honest, I was quite tempted just to have one slide that said 42 and in a kind of nice reference to uh, the great Douglas Adams. It's just, you know, that's the answer, right? You know, there's one answer to it because there's so much going on. Okay, good. There's some geeks like me. This is good. Um, but I've tried to uh, distill a bit more than just Douglas Adams references. And I hope if you guys can sort of ride with me along this, I'm not going to be able to get into all the detail on all the subjects here that I would like to do, but we're gonna try and touch on some that we can maybe come back to in our conversation. Um, and as you're probably getting the impression, I am aware of many, many hats, um, or possibly just uh, unable to concentrate on one thing for any very long time, but it's um, a real privilege to be able to take that breadth. And I think the point that uh, Martha was making about the quality of the master's course that they teach at IE is to get that holistic blend of skills. And one of the things that's made me very successful and, and enjoy my career in real estate so far has been being a generalist in a sector that is traditionally very, very highly specialized. Those specialisms are essential in terms of professional expertise, but can sometimes limit things where you, you don't know what you don't know. And when we're dealing with cities and places, it's really important to have that breadth. Um, now, there is this negative stereotype, unfortunately, for a reason of what a real estate investor and developer is. Um, you can go all the way through to kind of the, the Disney Pixar movie up, um, but 
what is real estate? I quite like this uh, sort of little graphic from The Balance a couple of years ago to remind us that it's kind of everything above, below and all sort of different types and that we are increasingly seeing new um, sort of granularization of asset classes emerging across these traditional core ones. But these points here that I'm pinging onto the screen are all some of the reasons why when Christine asked me, you know, why can't just get on with it? Why can't we say just deliver affordable housing, just deliver net zero? You know, you have the control. Surely if you have the land, you can just do it. There's a huge range of reasons that we could spend an hour on each of these as to why it's not working. But for me, those ones at the end, the misaligned motivations and the kind of reliance, frankly, on enlightened self-interest to drive change rather than actually understanding that we don't always have the whole life cycle under the same ownership. So there's not the drivers for the change that could potentially happen to always succeed. These are some of the issues that hopefully we can get into in our discussion today. Um, but whenever I ask anybody who doesn't work in real estate or property or design, you know, to, to say a kind of place that they like, they will always describe a mixed use place, you know, like King's Cross, Granary Square and Argent, those fantastic fountains despite the fact that actually that goes against all of the advice and the things that, you know, the planning consultants, the lawyers, the kind of advisors would say, you know, this, the liability that you have as a landlord for this, if something goes wrong, it's much better to gate it up and keep it secure and not have it open and free. But actually this blend of uh, leisure facilities, of workspace, of a sort of social um, activation spaces, of residential, is what makes a place that most of us like, most of us want to go to. And you see these all around the world in different forms. And I think one of the things our industry is really struggling with at the moment is getting the balance between this forever kind of seesaw of regeneration and gentrification. And Brixton in London is you know, one of the very famous case studies there of somewhere where has almost become a place that's done too in lots of scenarios. And whilst you're losing some of that kind of authentic community or they're feeling pushed out, Actually, that's part of what the draw to that place was. And, you know, how do you balance the kind of potential improvements that can come to a place, to a city, to a neighborhood without disenfranchising the people who made it what it was in the first place in some cases? And this is, you know, happens all around the world. This is a scenario in Cape Town. There was a real kind of um, very, very strong community who'd been pushed out to a very poor area by apartheid policies, frankly, abandoned for decades. But actually, when it then began to gentrify, were then moved on again. And so there's a real, this tension is, is always one between the development industry and you know, communities. And when we talk about things like place making, I think sometimes we forget that there's a place there already in many, many cases. And that actually it's about keeping the integration and that the, the essence of a place that sometimes is, is really, really important and a challenge because there's no real way to grapple with that in a, in a spreadsheet or an analysis. Obviously we all know when the kind of place and real estate has got it wrong. Things like buildings that are technically in line with regs, which is one of my most hated uh, comments from any advisor, but actually clearly not fit for purpose. And the devastating tragedy that happened at Grenfell reminds all of us that there are many, many buildings that are not fit for purpose, but are they being occupied and used very, very heavily. And the challenge of how you create quality buildings that can last for the future, not just for environmental use, but actually just for pure health and human safety is one that really faces all of us. And that was a, a terrible stark realization for many people of quite how much of our cities is not fit for purpose. And similarly, scenarios where things are technically legal and cannot be uh, sort of prevented in terms of uh, policy, but are clearly unethical. So this was a, a a uh, case in London where a social housing um, part of the development essentially had a play area that was two metres of asphalt compared to um, a very nicely fitted out play area for children who were not in the social housing. And this kind of social apartheid in a, in a new development is something that we really ought to be able to prevent, but you know, through various loopholes and, and was it permitted and was built. And similarly, in this desperation that we have for housing, for units and numbers, we forget that converting places that are simply not appropriate for families, for anybody really, um, Harlow and Terminus House is one particular example that has received an awful lot of negative press attention of somewhere that has no amenities, you know, no green space, no transport provision really, um, and actually real issues with crime and security and safety. But it's a place that you know can count as you have a bed for the night, but it's not really sufficient to be someone's home. So we really need to explore how our towns and cities can provide the right amount of housing. We're using existing buildings, but recognizing when they are not fit for purpose. 
So some of the things that Martha and Christina and I have talked a lot about are around this idea of gender mainstreaming. So um, in urban design, I think for me, the person I've seen who's talked about it best is the Deputy Mayor Maria Vasilaku, who is Deputy Mayor of Vienna for um, up until 2017. Uh, and she really pioneered in that city this principle of what she called fair shares in the city. So the idea that you really take through a different lens, the idea of um, how people, not just men, when European cities that have been planned post-war, predominantly for men who commuted by car, and you know the street layout and the lighting was predominantly around that, just to take another lens and think again. So that staircase there, historic, lovely, but very inaccessible for people with buggies or young children or mobility issues. So the city retrofitted in that elevator there to enable people to still to be able to use that route. Similarly, very simple things like allowing seating spaces around and in amongst play areas that really encourage teenage girls who are from really disenfranchised from public spaces to feel part of those spaces. Um, that's something that a UK charity called Make Space for Girls, which was only founded last year, and I know Christine has had talk at um, Festival of Place before, have pioneered some really interesting work in the UK to realise that a skate park is not sufficient provision for all young people. I'd also love to get into a bit more time if we had time, but the work of Transport for All and other advocacy bodies recognising the need for accessibility for people with other kinds of mobility issues. It's very frustrating to see on Twitter this week that the opening of the Northern Line extension in London uh, to the Bassey Power Station station includes lifts that actually aren't wide enough for kind of large wheelchairs to get into your turn in, which just seems like such a missed opportunity. I won't have to kind of flagship some of the places that I think are getting it right and all of the, what all of these have in common is a very long-term view and a, a willingness to invest in the things that don't give you an immediate return, but will bring you a return in the long term and are kind of doing it right and focusing on those sustainability impacts. And so this, the mailings in Newcastle is by one of our JV partners, Igloo Regeneration, in really, really granular community focus um, development on the waterfront, regenerating a kind of former industrial area. Um, where I live in Bristol, this is where I spend a vast amount of time drinking too much coffee, and eating but it has activated again what was a kind of disused gravel car park in a sort of light industrial area that has really become a very vibrant hub with a fantastic mix of social housing and for sale housing and rented and loads and loads of leisure and retail and a really thriving mix that's come up very, very quickly um, as far as it looks from the outside but it's really successful and uh, New Islington in Manchester by Urban Splash is another fantastic example really pioneering sustainable design as well and so to quickly pivot to that, all of those things show that we can do net zero. And this is one of my favorite memes on the internet. I don't know who to credit it to. I couldn't find a source, but I think everybody is suddenly an expert now in the kind of ESG world and, you know, getting to net zero. And there's lots of kind of definitions and policy being thrown around. I just wanted to highlight some of the reasons why it can be done, but it's a bit more complicated, but what some of the drivers are in the real estate sector. And actually preparing for this reminded me that 10 years ago, I worked on this report, which was kind of convened by Arup for the World Economic Forum, all about getting at that point commercial real estate to really focus on the benefit of retrofitting. And I dug out this quote, which slightly depressed me because I realized that I doubt that we're much further on than retrofitting 1% of existing building stock. And that the failure of, for all those kind of range of reasons is what I touched on earlier, those misaligned incentives that make it very, very hard to really catalyze the change when you don't have consistent ownership over the life cycle. Um, it's very, very hard to get people to integrate and agree on how to deliver these significant changes, whether they're environmental or cultural. There was also some ULI research, the Urban Land Institute in 2014 by Professor Sven Bienart, which is really fantastic. I recommend you kind of dig it out. But you know, he then seven years ago was looking at um, research that cited global insurers assessing over 100 billion a year of losses, direct losses related to climate impact on real estate. And that actually real estate values account for three and a half times GDP of developed countries. And so those increasing number of incidents to do with climate are having huge impacts on the portfolios. And actually the bottom line being hit of large real estate investors and owners is starting to, I think, was waking people up to the idea that we needed to address climate in more than a token way. Um, and I think that this kind of trajectory of increasing numbers of events, we know just this year, wildfires in Australia and California, horrendous floods across China and uh, Germany in particular, a terrible drought in Bulgaria. You know, we are seeing the, the frequency and the extremity of these climate events. It's right in front of us now. 
this headline just from last week, a friend in the US sent me that actually federal flood insurance rates are now likely to become significantly higher, um, as well as our own kind of utility crisis in the UK at the moment. So hitting the bottom line, unfortunately, for all the kind of motivating factors it should be, this is having an effect. I won't go into too much detail. There's a ton of great webinars from people like Arif, the Association of Real Estate Funds, if you want to have a look in more detail. But the Financial uh, Stability Board had a task force in 2017 on climate related financial disclosures. This is what is pushing the financial real estate investing sector, the pensions, the insurance sectors, um, the FCA have just done a consultation on this to really move to cataloging and understanding what they're calling physical risks and then transition risks. So the physical risk, very obviously the damage from things like the flood, the fire, whatever, but also then the, tra the cost of actually transitioning to make your portfolio more robust and more resilient. There is an acknowledgement that it's no longer discretionary now. This is something that has to be done and that there will be material costs that need to be met, that they can't be avoided. And so there is a ton of resources out there, but this is the thing that I think is now driving the institutional investment market in real estate to really, really look closely at their, their uh, responsibilities and, and their portfolios. The bit that makes it a bit more complicated is um, the granularity, particularly in residential, of buildings. Residential emissions are actually much higher than non-residential buildings. But almost all the benchmarks that have come out over the past few years, I think we're up to something like 550 different global benchmarks now for various elements of sustainability on real estate, are almost all around sort of office because it's a much more homogenous asset. It's far easier to control and you can get your tenants in and out much more quickly. And frankly, it's not homes and homeowners and all the kind of personal uh, complexities that go with that. But we know that even before COVID, the housing crisis in the UK, and I think in many other nations, was harming productivity. 43% of UK companies with over a 1,000 employees said that housing issues were having a negative effect on their business productivity. 48% felt it was affecting their staff well-being. And that word well-being has been something that, again, with COVID has become front and centre, realising that when we're using our, our, our places and spaces in a different way, that we need to acknowledge the health impact. And so again, there's more ULI research here, but I'd also really recommend, if you're not aware, looking at the Centric Lab, some fantastic neuroscientists who are sort of blending their expertise with real estate to produce really pioneering health data and advocacy around the, the kind of urban environments and how people should be more aware of actually the air, things like air quality and, and the whole environment around them and the real estate that they're in. Um, there is help coming. There's been a huge amount of work from leaders like Hill Break, who are really excellent consultants in the sort of sustainable fund space, just to kind of try and clarify this soup of many, many different regulatory frameworks and accreditations and benchmarks you can get around sustainability. Um, I've been working with uh, uh, colleagues in the kind of BPF subcommittee to try and get some guidance together for people who are in the kind of rental side of the market to try and understand the bits of ESG that are relevant. And this should be coming out in a few weeks. And just to try and be able to break it down as to what the audience is, the type of ESG measure it's going to be, the asset type and so on. So you can sort of look out for that. And finally, I also just wanted to flag up something which we can maybe get into. One of the charities I'm involved with is the Creative Land Trust, and they commissioned some research that was published last week around the impact of creative workspace on local residential property. And actually, again, for those of us who've worked in kind of place creation for many years, you've always sort of known that there's clearly an intrinsic value of having some kind of cultural activity going on beyond just meanwhile it sort of comes in and comes out but actually something long term but you could never put a, a number on it and that inability to be able to value it in an appraisal has made it very very difficult to fund at the front end actually this for me is the first research that i've seen and it's very very high quality that actually underlines the long-term value in a kind of 4.4% gain between creative workspace and residential property values so it's a win-win for those enlightened investor developers who can think about building in quality place assets from the beginning, not just what's in their red line and that they can sell. But again, part of the challenge is not every owner is long-term invested in that place or at that scale, but there's definitely some enough who are who can make a difference. And so in that quick canter through the kind of bits where I hope we can get into in a bit more of a discussion, but really just to look at successful places are the ones that put people first. The great Jane Jacobs, you know, said so, in, in many, many different ways, but particularly in that quote there, that there is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it, and it is to them, not buildings, that we must fit our plans. 
the whole point of the kind of this net zero race is to make our environments and our places work better for the people who are already there and the people who are coming to them. And so that's avoiding more disasters like Grenfell Tower, but it's also making sure that what we're building now that's new has good air quality, good uh, kind of transport options and infrastructure, good accessibility. And um, I hope that we can dig a bit deeper into some of those ideas um, in our discussion. Thank you so much, Alex. It's um, what a whirlwind. There's so much for us to, to start dig digging in there. And I, I can't wait to get people's questions as well. Martha, do you want to share some first reactions? Yeah, Al right. Alex, thank you so much. And Alexandra, I, I really appreciate your presentation because it's one of those that um, it's not, I'm not going to be thinking about it today. It's going to go on and on in my mind and I'll probably be thinking about it uh, for a long time. Thank you. Um, there, there are two questions I had. Let me start with the first that has to do with time. Um, I, I really appreciated that you spoke of the different agents, different industries, different factors involved in real estate. But when we look at time, it seems to be different for everyone. We know that politicians have a term in office. Um, we know that law um, it can uh, be more, it ha can have more longevity, but it takes a long time to get laws into place. Investors are thinking of their in, uh, return on investment. It could be seven years, 10 years. Sometimes it's even shorter if they're trying to sell into uh, uh, another market. And then people depending on the group, the country, there, there's uh, the use, people also have different time frames. So could you talk a little bit about that? Um, do you see any coming together of goals, even though we do have different time? What are the crucial aspects in terms of these different uh, clocks that we have running? And if you had to touch something, uh, which one would you touch? Where would you, where's the most sensitive one and where would you push? Oh, that's a great one, Martha. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with the people bit because that's, um, and for me, it's the, the demographic shifts that we've encountered in every city, in every country that we've always, you know, our, our greatest policy making brains have always failed to anticipate, whether that's road use or formation of single households or population expand, just growth through migration and sort of natural um, sort of living longer. We are woefully bad at projecting kind of demographically what need is going to be. And I think that's a real challenge when you're developing these illiquid assets that are very hard to change once they've gone up. Um, you're right, investment horizons are a really critical one. If you can get a long-term institutional investor, so pension funds are very, very keen on things like build to rent because it's essentially a liability matching for them that they can house people for the long term they want it's relatively low risk compared to something like office or hotels at the moment um, and actually there there is that long-term investment which allows you as a developer to actually put in kind of more stuff around it because you've got someone who's got skin in the game for longer than a traditional house builder model which frankly is about you know build it sell it, build it, sell it. And you know that you're maximizing your margin, but you're not really that engaged with the long-term place. Um, so yes, aligning those horizons alongside the political ones is really key. The one that I'm seeing most starkly at the moment is this, this anxiety over obsolescence risk. And for me, a lot of that comes around kind of the tech stuff. So you know, I, I, I use this all the time. I say, you know, you want to be the, the kind of iPod, not the mini disc. The mini disc was technically perfect and lots of kind of musicians still have them, but you know, it wasn't universally adopted. The challenge is if you're the kind of the, the developer who's fit a fixed iPhone charging docking station just before I, I, Apple come out with a new kind of lightning connector, that's a very expensive kind of way to proceed. If you have invested very heavily in a combined heat and power plant because you were told that that was going to be the most energy efficient but it, um, it's actually, it's burning stuff and is now not considered particularly desirable from a net zero perspective. You know, you'll, you'll feel that you've kind of been caught out by that things changing very, very quickly. So in an industry that, that tends to be quite analog and reverts to, we'll just do what we know because we can make money or we can know we can see with this. It, 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 it suppresses innovation because things actually in that innovative space are moving so quickly. So to your question, Martha, I think the bit that I would try to tweak and change is, is trying to find a way where within the regulatory environment where we can 
have that space for innovation where people aren't penalized. So for the people who have invested very heavily in things like CHP, which was a good solution, or, you know, were bought diesel cars because they were encouraged to do so by a government for a while, um, actually to be better at handling the transition of going, actually, okay, we were wrong. There's now something better, but we need to manage the transition of that process rather than just having a, this is gone, now come to this. Um, and I think regulatory wise, that's one of the things that really doesn't work in the so in the UK we've seen this debate around planning has gone on and on and on and on uh, whether or not you think it's fit for purpose or not but it's trying to kind of go for the whole scale shake of a system whatever ideas you come up with that's great but you need to be able to transition from the system we have now and for me that's often left out of the debate well how do we get there fine we're going to change to a fully zoned system but how do we how do we make that shift and so I think a bit more focus and attention on the transition which ironically is what comes out very, very strongly in the TCFD recommendations about mm -hmm. transition risk, as well as the physical risk of flooding, understanding the cost that investing in ESG improvements is going to add, but that it's unavoidable. Yeah, Alexandra, that's really interesting because um, maybe another area to press is on developers themselves. Um, the reason I say this is dovetailing on what you just said, a lot of development is based on looking to the past and maybe tweaking the model, but saying, well, this building next door sold, it was sold out in record time. I'll do a building because the demand is still there. Um, when we think of something like sustainable development goals, when we think of trying to transition to net zero, when we think of the pressures and the need for more sustainable methods in, in our buildings, these things are based on knowledge that we still have to create. We still need to do research. We still need to share understandings and we need to try to predict different scenarios in the future. So it seems to me from what you said, on one hand, development uh, is somehow it has a tradition or it's more comfortable looking to the past, even if it's immediate past, and it has this difficulty of looking to the future. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic about developers doing that? And how will you get them there? Is it tax incentive? Is it write-offs? Is it education? Is it pressure from um, communities? Is it law? What? How? How are we going? How are we going to get there? So I think the first thing I would say is that I think I see a real difference in Europe, kind of the old world, where you have so much existing stock heritage, the pressures to live up to kind of Palladian design aspirations of whoever's in power, versus markets like in Australia, um, an awful lot in kind of the new markets that are Africa and Asia and the US, where you know. Heritage is something maybe 20 or 50 years old and you can the pr process moves a lot faster. There's extensive tax breaks in there already. And so there's an ability to innovate and change. And if you get it wrong, you can you can keep going. I think Europe is really hamstrung by the weight of history and heritage sometimes to actually risk changing everything. I think also a good developer is a visionary, has a real, you know, whether it's an SME developer building kind of five houses, but to a really high passive house standard, or it's someone who's doing trying to do 1500 homes of all sorts of tenures or, or a large kind of shopping center. You know, to be a developer, you are the, the conductor bringing together the, the specialist expertise of your engineers, of your architects, of your investors, your planners. Um, a musician, every conductor I've ever worked with, to be a good conductor, you need a fairly substantial ego. And I think it's the same with developers, right? You need, you need to have that ego to hold to that vision for when things are going wrong and to get everybody to follow you. And so developers can be change makers. The, the real pioneering ones can be the ones who, who go, we are going to hit this standard. And we're not going to design it to regs. We're going to exceed the regs because the regs aren't good enough. To the, the latter part of your question, Martha, I don't tend to believe that we should be led by regulation because... No, I started my career in the civil service and the whole kind of sausages making of policy is it's a very slow process. And, you know, when things like the energy performance certificates were, were created, I worked in government then. The people who the scientists who led that said these are not really what we wanted. They're not good enough, but it's a start. And hopefully very quickly they'll be superseded. They haven't been. They've become the only data set that government has. And they've become a benchmark that we are using as a measure of an energy efficient building when it's not 
it's not accurate in any way, but it's become the only data set the government has. So it's the baseline for a huge amount of policy. So we're divorcing from reality ever further. That is where I think giving developers a bit more control um, and to employ a vision, but within kind of a framework of going, take us, you know, pioneer something sustainable and ethical, but, you know, let's not hamstrung you with regulations that are based on something that we already know is irrelevant. How you do that, how you construct that framework, I think is something we'd need to spend quite a lot more time on, but I would love, I would love to be able to be more optimistic. And because I think the developer caricature of the bad guy shoving as much the profits in the pockets and disappearing, that's actually very clearly not the case. You know, every good developer who's incredibly proud of the thing that they did. You know, when I worked for Stuart Lipton, it's the most remarkable thing to go around London with him and go, I did that, I did that, I did, you know, it's it's incredible. And I think we should recognize a bit more those in the sector who want to leave a legacy that is strong, not just a profit. Thank you. There's a couple of, uh, oh, sorry about that. Oh, I have a couple I, of questions may, may I that ask have come one, in. May I ask one more because it is related to what she said. Uh, and it has to do with um, these multiple definitions. Um, and can we, a home is much more than shelter. You mentioned that in your talk, Alex. Um, it, it is definitely a place of security, of family, of it, it's where we, where we live. And we saw with COVID, we do a lot more than just sleep and eat there with our families. We have to do a lot of things. But, uh, it's more than shelter because for a lot of people, it's investment, it's equity, yeah. it's a way to get ahead in the future. And going back to these different definitions, do you see that developers or perhaps public authorities are able to embrace this idea that home is more than a number of units where people will live, but it also, it also contributes to not only uh, our economy short term, but it empowers people. So it contributes to economy, it contributes to equality, and it contributes to making cities more vibrant and sustainable. Absolutely. Um, I think to get my bill to rent high horse, um, one of my massive frustrations with government over decades is this fixation on ownership and that reach to equity and as if that is the only way that it's ever been done when actually it's a relatively recent thing in, in, in kind of history but also that renting is somehow second class means that we have this incredibly negative sort of culture around running particularly in the UK um, but also that the what's not recognized often is that um, a premature termination of a tenancy so maybe that the landlord's son or daughter comes home from university and needs to have to move out is the second most common cause of homelessness in the UK you know the the insecurity of tenure is one of the things that makes renting really really volatile and something that undesirable what the build to rent sector is doing in terms of providing long-term you know rental in perpetuity with professional landlords to a high standard is trying to offer greater choice in the market and that stability where a home can be a home and just because you don't own it doesn't mean that you can't feel secure in that place put things on the walls whatever you know the material bits of it are, i'm less with it but actually i think for me home is is an essence is a feeling and the my mark of a successful sort of rental product is where you see people who are very clearly at home in a space whether it's a communal or otherwise um i think we have to acknowledge with the kind of some of this retrofit stuff and the kind of um the, the regulation that's being discussed around ESG improvements is that in cities where we have huge shortages of stock already, how you persuade residents to move out of rental homes in order to allow improvements to be made when they've got children in school and there's nowhere for them to go into. They've already maybe been on a waiting list for ages to get into that property. There's a there's not really any recognition of the complexities around that. It's not just funding and finding the contractors to do the works. It's actually how you manage the communities and allow those people to stay rooted in that place, keep their children in school, get to work sensibly but understand that they may not be able to live in the property for a matter of months. And so those those complexities are the things that I'm kind of getting worried about that we're just not addressing. I'm loath to jump in. I know you guys could talk for ages and it is really interesting, but I've got three questions from the audience and I, I want to respect their com their contribution. So there's one here for you, Alex, from uh, Ming Chang. If the industrial norm for development and regeneration is to lock down the place instead of something like the open granary, granary square approach. Um, how and what can we do to change this perception? So I think this is referring to this idea that you should, yeah, 
keep yeah. your development a little bit closed off. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very hard in an area where risk and liability are increasingly dominating our lives and the threat of kind of a lawsuit was, you know, when I started working in real estate, I went on a, um, I went on a site visit in Spain, inadvisably in stilettos, but I was told that the building was completed and it wasn't. And there was no PPE and no safety. And at one point on the 10th story, I was advised to walk across essentially a plank, like walking the plank. And it just, it absolutely boggled. But, you know, we would never, you would never say, well, if you did see that now, you'd be a bit concerned. Um, but I think that the problem is that the risk and the liability kind of elements that are controlling everything, safeguarding, are, are making it even harder. So it's it's not to berate lawyers who kind of quite reasonably point out that you have a liability and you have a red line and you need to control your space, but it, it doesn't incentivize that shared space. I think there would be something amazing to do in terms of looking again at things like adopted space in our kind of um, planning kind of lexicon and framework and working out if there's a way to have a lower liability shared spaces that developers could propose um, without having to carry the liability burden themselves. Um, but yeah, that that is a massive challenge. And I think from my point of view, I don't think it's a shortage of developers wanting to do that kind of thing. Very often the developers do get pilloried for not trying to do better public realm or placemaking. Very often they have loads of cool creative ideas, but it's not even the cost, it's that they're not allowed to do them. So one of my really sad things that I saw on Twitter in, in lockdown was that the kind of the beautiful water gully, I can't remember the proper name for it, but uh, um, more London was filled in, you know, and that wasn't inaccessible for people in, in wheelchairs or young children, it, but whatever it was, whether it was a cost reasons, that's, that's a piece of beauty in public space design that's been now kind of lost, uh, presumably for some kind of risk perspective. And I think we just need to fight that a bit. Um, this is kind of go going to jump around a bit because these are the, the questions yeah, that have come it. in. Um, so uh, a challenge with TCFD is that it does not have a framework for real estate, AREF, and others, you're going to have to That's do right, the jargon, okay. de-jargoning of it. I can, I can say it. <laughs> consensus so, around CREM as a standard for TCFD. How do we get some momentum around this? So first of all, Alex, for 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 some yeah, of the people fund out there, fund managers love an acronym, and, and John is a guru <laughs> of, of uh, investment fund management, for, and um, has been a real pioneer of um, actually with a, a huge chunks of European legislation over the years that has forgotten that real estate exists. So, you know, the Alternative Investment Fund Management Directive was something where, you know, John was one of the leaders who pointed out that they just missed it out entirely. It was all the kind of post-crisis banking regulation. They just forgot on the real estate market. Um, so okay, so let's let's just take this acronym by acronym. What's yeah, TCFD? Right, okay, so TCFD is okay. the, of course, the climate change and sort of financial disclosures, the point that I mentioned. So that's basically a kind of a system that many governments are adopting and many financial conduct authorities and services authorities are adopting as a means to try and push insurers, pension funds, um, institutional investors to tackle climate in their portfolios. Uh, John is quite right that it doesn't recognise real estate. So it's got lots of really complex carbon calculations that are pretty much impossible if you've got a portfolio of thousands of people's homes, for instance, or shopping centres. It, it, it's, it's a kind of blind spot of the carbon kind of uh, community who've created this. ARF is the Association for Real Estate Funds. As I mentioned, they're doing a lot of work. I actually sit on the impact investing and ESG committee there and so we are lobbying a range of bodies to kind of go hello we're here you need to make this relevant for us. CREM is another is an academic based uh, real estate um, benchmark a carbon benchmark essentially um, but again as I think I said in my slides it's very focused around commercial it sort of it technically could be done for residential but the resource that you'd need to fill in those kind of templates is very very difficult so yeah, there does need to be some momentum. I spent a lot of last month writing responses to the Financial Conduct Authority pointing out that it's a bit more complex and a bit more granular, particularly for residential real estate, but actually for mix of uses. And so I think this is one of the, the quirks of our industry, right? We've got, It's not a static asset. You know, it is a building and it is an asset on a spreadsheet in one sense, but actually it's, a th it's almost buildings are these breathing things with people coming in out of them and the energy flow changes and we need regulation that understands that flex and that variability and whilst it's wonderful to see the sector kind of picking in the financial services sector picking up climate and really going no we're going to try and address this there's a real risk that you have these sweeping uh, regulations that essentially leave huge chunks of real estate portfolios inoperable um, obsolete and actually then people either flog it sell it off what do you do then you push a load of stuff into a kind of gray market 
that's un relatively unregulated. There's such demand as we know, and it takes such a long time to get planning and build new stuff. Actually, what are you doing? You're probably making less safe, less secure, lower quality places for the most vulnerable in our societies. Actually, what I think is better is to try and do what we're doing through bodies like Arif um, and others. But you know, I think as I tried to say again at the beginning, our industry is so professionally siloed. There's huge bodies of expertise. You know, we do need rooms where there are carbon kind of specialists and sustainability engineers, M&E engineers in a room with the institutional investors and the fund managers, in a room with the developers and the policy makers. Because, and that does happen sometimes, but it, it tends to be that everyone feeds in their specific element and when you're not getting exactly as Martha said that holistic piece at the whole you're not creating a workable place and maybe also as you pointed out if you're going to have to move people out of their place places in order to retrofit you know retrofit being such a that all this existing building stock it seems quite shocking to me that they wouldn't see the huge issue that is the real estate market um in these reports so that is well, we quite disappointing we don't talk as one voice, Christine. So no, I've always in it. If you say, I think even just by the words that you use, if someone talks about the built environment, they will probably be, a, you know, a policy person or an architect or you know someone who's really thinking about that, a designer, a planner. If someone talks about property, they're probably a developer or a builder. Uh, construction again, you know, very specific, do the making. And if someone talks about real estate, they're probably in the money end. And actually, even that, just the vocabulary that we use when we're all really involved in the the creation, the maintenance of place means that you you can be the kind of not lack of commonality of language right at the beginning so it's unsurprising that policymakers who dip in and out and are trying to get their head around it go for the the lowest common denominator element but there are no silver bullets in policy around this well that gives us a reason to exist because as you know we're really obsessed with breaking down silos in the industry and to kind of center around place so um and thank you so much john for uh making it into the character limit of the questions by using the most acronyms uh and and i learned a lot just 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 from that one uh translation um there's a question here from pam alexander alice you talked about social apartheid we can't get real tenure mix in residential buildings because of what does the, doesn't the business case of built rent make it more difficult? And how do we overcome these barriers? So there's a, a number of different layers here. So let's take it right from the beginning. Why, you know, when, um, yes, a built to rent investor is probably doing it because they can see it as a stable, diversified income generating. You know, you, essentially, if you build something half decent, whether you do very luxury or just kind of quite basic, the demand is such, if you've picked your location correctly, that you should be able to fill it to a a decent level and gradually kind of grow rents by you know one percent or chp or um whatever uh, each year um and, and make kind of a good a sensible return nothing too much a bit sensible um the challenge of getting there in a market that still doesn't you know what policy doesn't really understand what that build rent is and all those mixed tenure um when you have you can apply for a student consent as uh, so generous and have no affordability requirement at all is essentially lower risk if you're applying for a build to rent consent, there are a range of different ways, depending on local plans, discount market rent levels, whether you want a very deep discount with a few number of units that maybe are at an 80 or 90 percent discount, or you want a sort of sliding scale of lots of affordable units, but at different scales. There's a huge amount to negotiate with a local authority in your planning journey. Planning is very, very, very expensive. So even for an institution that's got deep pockets, there's a, a risk overdoing that so unfortunately again you get back to the thing of we might have aspirations to do a real mixed community we really want to have affordable reflected we don't just want discount market rent we want to include social rent what you then have is that the illogical headlock of our regulated um sector so the prs the private rented sector is the the wild west anybody come in a landlord if you have a property there's no kind of exam and there are some very very good ones and very very bad ones um the social rented sector it is extremely and rightly very heavily regulated but those mean that they, those operators feel they need much more control. So they are really, really loath to cede that control, even to a very high quality partner. And sometimes they're not allowed to by the objects of their organization. So you can sit there logically and go, I want to build 400 units. I would like to have 100 of those be at social rent. I will work with this social rented um, provider and, and they will allow me to, but I want to operate the whole because I own and I manage, I want to maintain, I want to provide the same services to everybody, not have a poor door, not have this and the other. But actually, the the in, again, the silos of different pots of money, different types of regulation, different types of ownership, just and plan different types of planning conspire to make that very, very difficult to deliver. It, it shouldn't be, but it is. And you need a certain level of scale to even enter in the fray on that kind of conversation. 
And so this is why you quite often see really, again, well-intended developments, but with the social housing element to the side, when the kind of, even if it's built in the same materials, maybe just not, you know, not got the best aspect or whatever, because a truly pepper bottled blended development is very, very hard to achieve. Um, how do we overcome the barriers? Because something I know that Pam and I you know, have talked about before, again, I think is just talking to, particularly to government who set those regulations and saying, you know, this is well-intentioned preservation of social housing. But actually, one of the reasons that I joined sort of PFP in the first place was that it was somewhere that had recognised that just building social housing on its own in isolation with whatever good intentions can create essentially ghettos. You're, you're on cheaper land, you're away from employment, you're away from transportation. And actually mixed tenure, mixed income places have better outcomes for everybody over the longer term, but they're more expensive and they're more fiddly to do. But that's what we should be doing, developers at scale and, and, and at small scale and at large scale. And I think allowing a bit more flexibility in the conversation around mix would be really good. But the reason that it quite often doesn't happen is it just hits a point where liability and risk becomes too much. And because you know what, it's easier, let's not try. We'll leave the social housing to one side or you know, we'll give that bit of land to a social housing product. They can just do it themselves. We'd love to have done it blended, but we can't. Or we'll just do a student building that's even easier. Could I jump in and Alex, I, I have a comment and also a question. Um, um, I guess I try to, I, I am the eternal optimist. And I think that there may be two areas where we could see improvement in diversity in our rent to build or in our rental properties. One has to do if we can somehow change the stereotype of culture, uh, as you mentioned before, that when we talk about renters, often people think rent is, is not the best and ownership is the, the real way to go. Um, I see a country like uh, my, my home country of the US is holds on to this idea. If you're in a condominium building, they want to limit the number of renters because somehow they think they're not as careful or they don't, um, they're not invested in community or they're not going to, somehow they're, they're not going to maintain uh, the building in many ways. But if we could, if we could change that culture uh, to a place, a country like Germany that has a huge percentage of rental. I think just changing the balance to more rental rather than just having ownership as being the primary model would be one thing. But the other area is, of course, we know Europe has an aging population. We have a larger uh, demographic uh, percentage in, in senior citizens. And um, I just read an article uh, last week in Bloomberg that talked about um, maintaining values, uh, monetary values in rental property, but it also talked about um, um, other uh, added value of community, of support, when there were younger residents along with, with senior citizens, when there was age diversity. Yeah. So maybe this is an area, and maybe you have some experience about this, because I think often when we use the vocabulary, social housing, we automatically think of maybe immigrant families or families uh, where unemployment or temporary uh, working situations is prevalent. And we don't think of the great diversity of different people and different groups in different situations throughout their life. Yeah. Absolutely. That, I think that the joyous mix that makes anywhere successful and I think is almost designed out again, it's by the you know viability appraisals, by you know funding allocations that require you to hit certain kind of pathways in order to, to be achieved. But actually when you you get to the end product and you see oh, if we'd had this mix, it would have been so much better. The demography one is really interesting. There's some been um so much work particularly the uli have done um with our residential council lots on later living and you know the aging in place nobody wants to think about it and actually frequently the decision to move somebody into a home is usually actually two-thirds of the time is not taken by that individual it's something that's done for them usually because of a fall or an incident or something and so unsurprisingly then the kind of health outcomes and the, the happiness is, is 
very depleted. You know, people want to stay in their space. Do they need to be owning that space? I think this has become one of the things that people are so fixated on. You know, you must have the equity in your home. Actually, that that belies a certain prejudice. If you know, you're living in a bit of the country where you've had that price inflation in a home, if you own it, and you know that it's guaranteed it. In much of Europe, you know, the inf- the kind of enormous inflation that's happened in our housing market in the UK didn't really happen. It's much more static. I would love us to see some kind of innovation maybe at the Treasury that does some of what they've done in Australia, where they take kind of superannuation funds, bearing in mind that we've only just adopted compulsory kind of pension saving in the UK, and we are a bit behind. But, you know, being able to kind of do some kind of matching of a a proportion of your rent with a pension saving scheme. And so you actually have a rent and a saving that go together. And actually, an institution that perhaps is a pension could do that quite easily. And it's a shared product. So you don't have that argument that somebody renting is then left without a kind of a nest egg to take them into retirement and later later age. I think the mix of, you know, there's so many great examples in the Netherlands and Germany, actually in, in Bristol where I live, there was a great one where they did old people's home for four year olds and they got a, a nursery uh, in with a kind of an older people's home and, and really kind of got them to work together and the outcomes for children and old, older adults were great. You know, there's tons of evidence for that. Again, unfortunately, those are both very heavily regulated settings and putting them together without a tv crew and a a tv production budget is probably quite difficult and so i I think the the intentions of safeguarding often override actually just quality of experience but i'd love to see more of that we don't have that many minutes left uh but i do want to squeeze one more topic and discuss it with both of you i mean you touched briefly on gender equity um and gender mainstreaming and we've just had two very uh well this year we've had two prominent murders in public spaces in london um i i you know we always think i don't know if it's always true but we always think that the money leads um and that investment leads we talked about that in climate change can it you know can it drive change for us and you know are you seeing any any awareness around accessibility and equality in your investment picture and then i will probably go to martha because you've got a bit of a global outlook and maybe you can tell us if you're seeing any uh, bright sparks or examples there so alex i think it's not to be flippant but i think it falls into the kind of rumsfeld known knowns and unknown knowns if you haven't experienced the fear that you know that there's a, there was a there's a thing on Twitter that had, you know, what a woman thinks about to go out for a run. And it's a list of, you know, holding the keys between your knuckles and not putting your hair in a way that it can be pulled and, you know, planning your route and that kind of thing. And a man just goes, go for a run. And it's, um, I think the mental load that we put onto, you know, our, our children and our daughters when they get to that point of being able to go out on their own and just being very aware that it is not the same experience. And so, you know, I remember when house hunting with my, you know, best friend from school who happens to be a six foot six you know, gay man and he experienced you know places we'd go to kind of a flat um that was under some arches in Vauxhall and he's like this is great and I'm like no I can't live here and so but we, we experienced you know when, when we did get broken into I defended myself with one of his size 13 shoes that was like the thing that I had to hand while the police were coming so um it's a very different experience and am I seeing it impact I think safety and you know quality lighting and all those kind of things are really well understood and quite often mandated but if you haven't experienced the kind of cold fear of just having to, to know that you just need to be careful um, and actually that you shouldn't just to walk home or to walk to school, or to walk to, it's, it's the most devastating thing. I think the bit that frustrated me most was well-intentioned advice from a number of people saying, oh, no, do some self-defense classes, then you can go running in the dark. And I, thought, I did that. I did that at school. I did kickboxing at uni and I'm, you know. It's fine, but that's not the point. This is about it shouldn't be up to women to defend themselves for vulnerable people to feel that they are the ones who have to make the change. Um, But can you put that in spatially? I I don't know, because then we get into this whole kind of thing of our society is very, very um, reticent about things like CCTV and privacy and control. And so um, being observed, I'd be interested what Martha thinks, but um, it's a tough one. I, I, I think, uh, Alex, you brought up a lot of really, really good points. One thing definitely has to do with the feeling of safety and, and security. I, I also think the concept of accessibility. Um, and, and again, this goes back to what was talked about in the beginning. It's also a question of definition. And so if we were to understand that accessibility for women is different than for men in, in many situations, 
But if we would also understand that accessibility of children is different than elderly people, yeah. someone who maybe uh, uh, has a sports injury, uh, a teenage uh, young man or young woman with a sports yeah. injury is needs accessibility in a different way than someone in a wheelchair. But I, I do think that the concept of universal accessibility, in other words, saying that not, not to standardize and make a bland environment, but to say that um, we have different needs uh, at different times in our life, different groups, and planning, architecture, design must be sensitive to this. So I think we have to push in that direction and um, make sure in education, in legal frameworks and planning that, that we push in that direction. Yeah. The other one um, that we I mentioned the other day to both of you is the idea of um, performance-based planning. And there's an area of Madrid, the north part of Madrid, that will undergo great development. It's a huge tract of land, and it's taken a long time to get to the point of uh, planning permission. But one of the requirements was a study, just like an environmental impact study, was an accessibility study that focused on gender equality. And planning permission would not be granted or would not have been granted if it was thought that the overall planning, that the ideas and the legal framework for this area was somehow discriminatory against mm -hmm. women. So I think those are two areas that we can look to. And of course, um, I think that education is really important and it's formal education of empowering women through knowledge, through degrees, but it's also, um, it's also seeking diversity in our faculty, our classrooms, the documents we use, the bibliography, the events that we hold. And it's also realizing that today, uh, discrimination is extremely subtle. And you gave an example of um, when you were looking for a, a, a flat and with a friend. Discrimination, I think, is so subtle. I, I, I was recently at, at a wonderful dinner. I was sitting at a table where there were mostly men. And it had to do with real estate and other things. It was surprising to me. I was not included in the conversation until I could prove myself that I had something to add. It was assumed that on this table, if you were a woman, you were more in a soft profession, maybe you were accompanying someone, maybe you were there for, I'm not sure what reason. Yeah. But the conversation, um, no one asked me anything, no one asked my opinion uh, at, in the beginning. Thankfully, uh, over dinner, we got to know each other a little bit better and were able to have a very enriching conversation. But I think that it's just an example of how it, it is very subtle, at least yeah. in Europe and, 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 and North America. Discrimination is very subtle and we always have to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and, and uh, walk the walk to really feel how, how pervasive it is. And, and we have to stand up and challenge it at every chance we can. One of my heroes is uh, Rick Lewis. He's an African-American, six foot seven basketball playing uh, real estate investor based in the UK. And he talks a lot about pioneer fatigue. I think they think when people go, oh, well, we've got Rick. And he's like, well, um, I've been the only kind of black African-American man in the room for enough time now. Let's kind of move it on. And I think there is that, you know, the, the thick skin that you're required to have to always insert yourself into a conversation and point out that you do have a, a perspective that's worth sharing. I think you know, that is something that does need addressing. The bit I quickly wanted to jump back in, Christine, while I was thinking while Martha was talking, is actually I would love to see more more play. And something I know you've had Tim Gill and Dinah Bornat talk about their amazing sort of research on the importance of play for children. And it was one of the most devastating things for me in lockdown, dragging my child past a roped off crime scene, roped off kind of playground, because she, for whatever reason, they decided they couldn't go on those. Um, but actually, I think play for adults and, and a way of engaging maybe policymakers and everybody. One of my favorite experiments, I think it was in, um, I think it was in Montreal, but um, I'll check but somebody drew a hopscotch square 
and then filmed it on a street outside a sort of subway station and filmed it for an hour and just how many people kind of jumped on it or hopped or played and it was it's just the most life-affirmingly wonderful little kind of video just to watch the range of people who cannot resist just hopping along something very simple like that and actually when we talk about good design and public realm it doesn't need to be hugely expensive kit and equipment that needs maintenance and you know it can be something really simple like that that people can interact with and enjoy and you know but if you know if i ruled the world i would make all policymakers and people who take planning decisions have to push a double buggy around an upper bridge and kind of i'd make them try and spend a day in a wheelchair on the tube i would make them kind of go to a playground that is broken and with and small children and try and deal with that because i think that's what I would change, getting people to have that lived experience. So even if it's not your everyday norm, you can have a little bit of that insight into kind of going, oh, maybe that's why we need to do that differently now. That would be my change. A hundred percent, Alex. I mean, I think that the other thing you pointed out there around uh, play, but also just a courteous, a courteous, you know, a courteous built environment, a courteous city, you know, where, where, you, where you, if someone came to your home, you would offer them a seat. You would make sure that they, you know, had a glass of water for free, uh, you know, or a drinking fountain. You would make sure that they could use your, you wouldn't say you can't use my, you know, you can't use my bathroom unless you pay me for your glass of water. You know, can we have generosity in our, in our cities and places again? And, and so much of the victims of violence and the victims of, of discrimination in our built environment are, are the same kinds of people, you know, who are being edged out in so many different ways. And it's, um, but anyway, it's really great to tap into your passion and yours as well, Martha. I know this is something we really share. I want to give a, I'm going to be wrapping up, but there's a couple of comments here. I want to shout out to, to Jamie um, and to Elizabeth, because I, I didn't put your questions, but I thought you made uh, great comments, Jamie, on working in marginal um, markets and trying to get developers to look beyond regulations uh, and and how viability uh, trumps most other things. And uh, Elizabeth talking about research in Letchworth where um, shares in the town were the way forward and an Australian has suggested it shares in your home as a pension, which is a great idea for uh, renters who, who want to have that sense of equity in their home. We have loads of play at the Festival of Place. This is my little uh, tickets on sale. Don't forget your 30% uh, percent discount, but I have actually centered loads of it around adult play. We're gonna pretend that it's really serious and you're gonna be learning, but actually you're gonna be playing and meeting other people and, and connecting with people uh, really important. We're getting this community together in a space for the first time. Uh, and so we've got uh, Tim Gill doing an interactive workshop there. You mentioned his work on childhood play. He's gonna be playing with grownups uh, to teach them about um, how we view risk really, how we view risk and violence liability and how we make those kind of instant snap decisions and about how we, we need to, to take risks when it comes to planning educated risks. How can we calculate those risks? We've got um, Play Disrupt coming. They're going to be doing some amazing uh, games uh, to kind of make us think about planning uh, differently, Lego legislation and also an interactive workshop. We've got, um, oh my goodness, we've got so many. We've got walking tours, really playful uh, experience. And then we also have some very uh, serious and insightful talks. So do, do come along. Um, for the play or the insight or both, uh, but you can check that on the website. I think there's a link in it. And uh, Martha, I'm gonna pass over to you to, to bring us out. So um, what are the last things we need to know? We need to go to your website, I think, and look up and what's the deadline? Um, well, we have a, we have running admission, so there really is no deadline. We're always open to uh, talented uh, students and members of our community. Uh, if they're women, we're especially open because we need you in real estate. Um, you, you can make a big difference. And the only thing uh, left to say is it's always a pleasure to be with you, Christine and Alex. And it's wonderful to know that we share these goals of looking holistically, of going beyond the boundaries and of supporting uh, supporting, uh, enriching our vocabulary with knowledge and understanding from other fields. Because after all, our cities and our built environment is made up of all of us. And so we need a lot of knowledge, education, and understanding from all of us to make it successful and vibrant for the future. It's a pleasure and I hope to see you in Madrid online or in London uh, in the near future. Yes, please. Thank you. Alex, thanks so much. I feel like we could have had so much time. We could have done a whole talk on uh, place-based creative value. We could have done a whole talk on gender equity. We, we did it, we did it. Uh, we scratched the surface on, on net zero and investment. And I'm sure there's lots of conversations that are gonna come for that, but I hope we have you back in future for to unpick more of these things together. Thanks so much. And yes, emoji applause, everybody. Thank you for having thanks me. Thanks everyone for coming.
Uh, thanks everybody for coming. We'll see you back um, uh, hopefully at our next Bite Size event and also at the Festival of Place. Oh yes, and also our lounge will stay open. So if you do want to jump on a table, the space that you'll be sent to automatically after this session, you can sit on a table and say hi to some of the other people here. So um, so we'll leave that open in for the next hour, um, but, uh, but probably the next 15 minutes are the magic time. So do click on a seat, open a video chat, say hi to some of the people here. Goodbye everybody.